This is a University of Otago podcast. ...which was released in the same year out of sight. Um, <laughs> in 2005, he was named a Guggenheim Fellow, and uh, in, a, in a CV that could dedicate a whole session on its own, uh, merit a whole session on its own, he's been a member of the human... Domenicon. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Genetics Otago and uh, the University of Faculty of Law for putting together this wonderful conference, Sophia Mackay, Colin, others. Um, and thank you all for bringing me to Dunedin. Uh, I spent last term uh, teaching at the University of Edinburgh, and I didn't know that there was an Edinburgh South. So it's really quite exciting for me. Um, I also feel a little bit uh, uncomfortable sharing this podium with David and Andy, uh, because I really feel a little bit out of my depth when it comes to the sports issues. And I think you'll see why as I proceed. I'll explain my incapacity shortly. So, very quickly, I'm not going to spend much time on this because David has given us a far better explanation. I want to look at the ethics of gene doping, or begin to look at the ethics of gene doping, and I'll try to complete that enterprise a little bit later today when we return to it. The possibilities. Um, and uh, David has just uh, spoken about uh, the use and abuse, abuse of gene products. Most of those chemical agents are naturally occurring molecules that are produced by our genes. And one classic example is erythropoietin, uh, which enhances uh, the ability of cells to uh, carry oxygen and produce such cells as well. Um, and there you have just simply the injection of a drug, essentially, that is a gene product in its own right. Uh, on the horizon, perhaps happening, is actual gene therapy type interventions. Uh, in such cases, uh, you actually first create uh, a virus who, uh, whose genetic payload has been altered uh, to produce genetic materials once inserted into a somatic cell in the body. Uh, this virus is, uh, alters, uh, uh, is injected into the body where it affects the genes, in this case, to produce uh, repoxygen, I think it is, uh, enhancing oxygen uptake. The advantage of this over the simple insertion of a gene product is that it's now in the genes. So there's continuing production of the desirable agent and maybe as well uh, something that's much harder to de detect uh, uh, by authorities. And finally, of course, we have the uh, distant vision of actually genetically modifying children uh, so that they are born with genes that uh, have these abilities within them. This is the genetically modified baby. Not so long ago, Nadia Rosenthal at Harvard um, actually produced a knockout uh, mouse, a mouse with a gene insertion uh, into it, in fact. Uh, in this case, I think for IGF-1, uh, these were called Schwarzenegger mice because they performed much better on various strength and endurance tests. Indeed, the older mice in the study, as they age, performed as well as young mice, young normal mice. So it actually uh, reduced the effects of aging. Pointing to a problem here that I'm going to return to, the fine line between therapeutic uses and enhancement uses of these kinds of agents. What could help an elderly person with a muscular uh, disability can also be misused by a younger person for sports enhancement. So getting started. Now I've got to apologize. I'm going to now briefly engage in a rant. Uh, you are looking at an athletically impaired, athletically challenged individual. And I confess that. Uh, I know from uh, my childhood that sports ain't fair. Sports are not fair. You can detect this a little bit if you look at me, age about nine or ten. I don't know when this picture was taken. There I am with a friend, Alan. Notice that Alan is wearing the baseball cap, but I'm not. I had a disastrous encounter with baseball in my childhood. I was always the person last chosen for anything. I was the person that when in U.S. baseball when there were uh, three people on base, three men on base, Two outs, and I came up, the team groaned. You could just feel the negative vibrations coming at me. Later in life, I learned there was a reason for this. I seem to have some, and I would say genetic impairment, that prevents me from catching incoming objects. 
I'm very good at throwing things out, and I'm good at shooting and driving, but throw your keys to me near a drain, and we'll both walk home. I assure you, right? Uh, I just can't. I can't coordinate that at all. The consequence was, when we choose up sides, I was always the last person chosen, and that with despair. Even fair choosing, I was left out, if possible. I was left to the side. I know this experience acutely. Dad, I made the team. What's a water boy? Right? This was my entire youth. Uh, David Benjamin has actually written about the phenomenon, last kid picked, and it's worth reading what he has to say. I got to bat four times. These were my first efforts to hit a hard ball, which I couldn't help thinking might unexpectedly veer off the pitcher's hand and smash into my face, inflicting damage so severe that I might end up at the Toma VA hospital. In anticipation of this youth-wrecking calamity, I winced and leaned backward every time the ball bored in on home plate. Oh, I remember that. Then I swung. I managed one foul ball in my 12 swings. But note what follows. I remember the dad who came up to me after the father-son servers game 30 years before and told me I stunk. I remember the hurt he had inflicted. He had violated the segregation of kids and grown-ups to deliver an insult to a child. But then he had crossed back over the line never to acknowledge me again. He had shown no interest in my improvement. He gave me no advice, offered me no consolation, volunteered no coaching. My entire experience of athletics in, uh, in grade school and high school was that the coaches had wanted to basically have nothing to do with me. They were not educators, they were competitors. And I didn't fit into their picture at all. So when I say sports are not fair, I know it from a personal uh, involvement. My second key point today is that fairness, as we consider what is fair in sports, fairness is not really an argument. It is the conclusion of an argument. And here I'm going to engage in a philosophical point. You have to follow me pretty closely. First, let's look at some definitions. There are at least two rather different definitions of fairness offered by the dictionaries. One is you're fair if you're, you're acting impartially and honestly, free from self-interest, prejudice, or favoritism, such as a very fair person to do business with. There's another sense of fairness is conforming with the established rules. This is a rule-oriented notion of fairness. Unfairness is violation of the rules. Cheating is violation of the rules. So the rules come to the fore here. Not impartiality, equality, objectivity, but rule obedience. And we see that, I've been listening today as people mention cheating, they almost always do so synonymously with the mention of the rules. Cheating is the overt or covert breaking of rules to gain advantage in a competitive situation. Andy, Mia, I think, has put this very importantly when he tells us the, uh, that the idea that cheating or rule breaking is determined solely by what is outside the rules begs the question, as to what ought to constitute the rules in the first place. So to say that something is unfair is to say that it breaks the rules, but then we must determine what the rules should be. And that's not simply a matter of fairness or not cheating. There's a, there are considerations that go into, in the first place, what the rules should be and what should constitute its violation. And that returns me to my point that we have to examine uh, uh, the rules themselves. Fairness is not an argument, it is the conclusion of an argument once we achieve an understanding of what the rules should be. My third key point is that which techniques or technologies the rules should permit or forbid is the outcome not of a single factor, but of a complex multifactorial decision. This is a very important point. One of the most characteristic mistakes we make in reasoning morally is thinking that one consideration alone is going to determine our thinking, when usually these are matters of complex multifactorial decisions. Determining death, 
the end of life. Right? Not simply a biological issue, but questions of a multitude of considerations that come to bear on a final definition of what should constitute death. I'm saying the same thing is true with regard to when we declare that a technology is unacceptable. A multifactorial decision. I can schematize that quickly by saying we have a host of different considerations, right through consideration N, that come together. These considerations produce the rule. We finally settle on what should be the practice and what should not be allowed in the practice. And then, cheating or unfairness are a breaking of that rule. Unfairness alone does not determine the rule. Unfairness is more the outcome of the process. Okay? It's my philosophical point. So, what are some of the considerations that we want to allow to militate against the technology? What are the considerations when we think of gene doping that come to the fore in our thinking? I'm going to give you a list. It's not a complete list. Right? There are, I, one of the most exciting opportunities here is to expand this list a bit. One I realize after the fact and decided not to put it in is tradition as a consideration in what should be in the rules. Do we want to respect those, those uh, uh, records of the past and so on? Tradition should be on this list. But these, I think, are the most important ones that come to mind. And some of them we can anticipate. They've been discussed. Health and safety is a major consideration about what the rules should be. Health and safety. Does it only, does the technology or technique that we're considering only foster positional advantage, winning for somebody, rather than something more general as well. Is it preventable or controllable? Can we stop it reasonably? Where does it place the locus of achievement that we're examining in the sport? Where does it position that? There is the consideration of the so-called spirit of sport, Spectator enjoyment, mentioned today by Andy at the start, is a consideration in our thinking uh, about a technology. And then finally, there is inclusiveness in a narrow sense of bringing more people into the enjoyment of the sport itself. More openness of people of different talents to the sport. That's a consideration. I call that fairness in the narrow sense. Let's take a look at these more closely. Safety. Big issue. We've just heard David mention the East Germans. This is Cornelia Enders, East German swimmer, four gold medals. Okay. And you can see something is wrong just looking at this body form. Right? Many East German athletes were unknowingly administered. Maybe some were knowing of it, but many perhaps unknowingly. And they have had sub subsequent multiple health problems. This is going to be one of the foremost considerations in thinking about any technology in sport and what its implications will be. Again, David mentioned earlier to the EPO in the early years when, when cyclists were dropping dead from blood viscosity caused by the use of EPO uh, at that time. So uh, again, a, an important consideration. But note, here's where I want to emphasize the fact that these decisions are never single factor decisions. There are multiple factors that come together to shape our decision. Because safety surely cannot be the sole consideration in the sport. If so, why else would we permit boxing? I looked this up on the web. What are the most dangerous sports in the world? Well, one of them is luge. Very dangerous sport. And yet everybody's enthusiasm for luge leads us to permit the sport itself. Right? So, there's a, safety is a big consideration here, but it is not going to always be determinative about a technology. We have to balance it against the other considerations that fit into our picture. Does it only foster positional advantage, winning for some? That worries us in sports. The winner coming to the fore. If it's only going to assist that particular, but not do anything else for the sport, the spectator, competitors, but just help one person, then we stand back. We shy away from it. Preventability, controllability are, is an important consideration here. 
Some things just cannot be stopped. And then we, if the, if the uh, other factors together don't dictate a different answer, we'll go with it if we have to. Uh, here's a, a simple example, carbo-loading. Uh, this makes your cook more important than you in some respects in, in athletics. There's a huge amount, we just heard mention of that expensive urine uh, uh, in the Olympics. So we're just not going to get into every detail of what somebody eats, especially if it doesn't press against other points and considerations of great significance or importance to us. One that the World Anti-Doping Agency tried to wrestle with is hypobaric training. Uh, train high, compete low. Uh, build up that volume and, and efficiency of the blood system by high altitude training. Well, WADA went back and forth, back and forth on this for several years and finally, for a variety of reasons, said no, you know, it's, first of all, what are we gonna do, are we gonna keep them off the heights? Are we gonna prevent uh, uh, cyclists from uh, preparing for a race? Impossible to do. Many other things went into the consideration, but there you have a simple illustration. Something that's been taking hold recently, I'm not sure of the exact current state of it, is the use of freezer vests by marathon and other endurance runners to get that body heat down because the body heat as it builds up becomes suppressive of performance later in the race. So people are doing this. Uh, until somebody drops dead of a heart attack, perhaps it's going to go on. Um, but it shows that controllability, preventability is a consideration in our thinking. The locus of achievement. What do we want to applaud? What is it we're looking toward as the, the pivot of the athletic competition uh, that we're celebrating? Do we want to move this competition off the playing field, out of the pool, and into the laboratory? Is, that, is it your, the best scientist that is going to be the winner of this competition? Is that what we're talking about? And this is something that goes back and forth in our thinking uh, about athletics, materials in athletics constantly appearing. Um, the fiberglass pole vault, which changed the nature of the event of the competition, actually wiped tradition away by altering world records and so on, but it was felt that on balance this was something that would enhance the sport as a whole and uh, should be allowed to go ahead. Uh, the fast skin swimsuit, again, measure of, of uh, uncertainty and even as new models are introduced the uncertainty increases about the impact, but it was allowed in the end, uh, in part because it was felt not to materially affect the performance in terms of the, uh, uh, the co competition among various contenders. Here is a place where we decided to limit the laboratory. Uh, Formula One racing, severe limits on the power, size, uh, uh, and materials and such used in these racers. Interestingly, perhaps because a safety consideration was coming to bear. That is, the machines grew more and more powerful, the risks to drivers and the public were growing. And so there was an effort. But also, in part because they said, this should not be a competition among different garages, it should be a competition among drivers. That's where we want to keep the center of competition. Again, racing, bicycle tourism, uh, another illustration. The Tour de France bicycle cannot exceed, I think, 15 pounds at the current time, and uh, mechanics must actually put weights on the bicycles used because they can be much lighter than that. So in order to stay within the rules, again the thought was we don't want to transfer achievement to the garage, to the mechanic, to the laboratory, rather than to the cyclists themselves, and so on. Uh, as, let me go back to that. Uh, Andy, uh, whose work I've drawn upon so, so often here, uh, has mentioned the tennis ball. Uh, sometimes uh, one laboratory intervention provokes the need for another. So the introduction of composite rackets, back when, so enhanced the performance of servers that in the 90s, 
uh, World Tennis Association began to say, it's ruining the game. We're not seeing the rallies that we ought to see, and so on. So here, a technology altered the enjoyment of the game, and uh, they began to propose ways of slowing the ball down or making the likelihood of rallies more transparent. One of the problems here is you do get on slippery slopes, and interventions do change, have, have unexpected impacts, and force you to make new decisions and choices in the future. Frequently invoked here is the spirit of sport. That should read World Anti-Doping Agency and their definition. They say this is an important consideration. Ethics, fair play and honesty, excellence in performance. It's a pivotal value here. Character and education, fun and joy, teamwork, dedication and commitment, respect for rules and laws, respect for self and other participants, courage, and community and solidarity. I want to return briefly to my rant. Okay? I am very cynical about this point. I am very cynical. Because I have seen that often, rather than these values, winning alone often trumps both competitors' and spectators' interests in sports. So I would certainly want to say WADA is right in this definition, but it is only one piece of the picture. It's not the determinant. The spirit of sport is not a determinative factor in anybody's consideration of these issues. Tom Murray, a friend of mine, and chair of WADA's uh, Ethics Issues Review Panel, stated at one time, for any particular means for enhancing performance, the crucial test, crucial test, will be whether it supports or detracts from sports as the expression of natural talents and their virtuous perfection. Well, this is an ideal, but I think it is not by any means the crucial test, as Tom defines it. Maybe it should be the crucial test, but it's not the way most people evaluate technological interventions in sports. And I would point something else out, too. There's an inherent problem in the definition. On the one hand, we have virtuous perfection, by which I think Tom means the exercise of personal excellence, training, effort, all of those things. And yet against what? Against natural talents. That is, the, the genetic luck, the randomness of the genetic, is accepted right from the start. So it's not just effort, it's what you've got that comes together. And there's a tension here, as we'll see in just a moment when we return to a narrower definition of fairness. Finally, I would add, and not insignificant, spectator enjoyment as a consideration in sports decisions. This is a perhaps appalling example. As one fan observed when Barry Bonds surpassed Babe Ruth's number of career home runs, quote, steroids or no steroids, the man pulled it off. That's an all too prevalent attitude, and it enters seriously into a number of uh, considerations. Let me go back to the mention of tennis once again, where spectator enjoyment of the game was a very powerful consideration at work in the effort to uh, suppress the advantage of, of, of the server in competition. So, this is a very important factor. Finally, we come to a consideration uh, of fairness in the narrow sense. As equal, I'm now here defining this as equal access, uh, openness of the sport, not simply from a spectator point of view, but from a participant point of view to many people. Um, even to people like me. That is to say, people who are not genetically talented at all. Uh, as a consideration, to some extent this is done in sports education but it hardly plays much of a role in any other form of sports. If we take fairness strictly as a value, and here's a, a somewhat troubling thought, if we take fairness in this narrow sense of equality of access to participate as a consideration, it actually militates for gene doping, not against it. Fairness here comes to militate for gene doping. So, when we think about gene doping as an issue, 
I've observed that sports are not fair, but maybe they should be in that narrow sense. Consider a person like Errol Mantaranta, gold medalist in cross-country skiing, many years, but for 20 years of his athletic career, he was dogged by allegations of gene doping. Finally, after much time, he was actually looked at at the genetic level, and it was found that he carried naturally a gene similar to the, to the gene for EPO production that made him an exceptional endurance athlete. So here we have an example of just genetic luck at work. Look at this guy, Lance Armstrong. We still have allegations of doping there, but put those aside. This is a, an individual whose heart resting rate is so low that it is said that if a physician examined him, he would think he was in heart failure. It's so low. And yet he can go up to 200 beats per minute with no adverse effects. His VO2 ability, his oxygen carry, is many times that of the average individual. His leg bones are precisely positioned for cycling excellence. He is a genetic freak, as was Manteranta. The bioethicist Julian Savalescu, uh, a man after my own heart, puts it very succinctly when he says, sport discriminates against the genetically unfit. Sport is the province of the genetic elite or freak. He believes that we should allow moderate performance enhancing drugs in sport. His argument applies to gene doping as well. And I have a long quote from here worth listening to. The result, he says, will be that the winner is not the person who was born with the best genetic potential to be the strongest. Sport would be less of a genetic lottery. The winner will be the person with a combination of the genetic potential, training, psychology, and judgment. Olympic performance would be the result of human creativity and choice, the choice to properly apply these drugs, not a very expensive horse race. So the equality or fairness consideration actually comes in on the side of doping, not against it, according to Sabonescu. So should we use these new tools to level the playing field? That's our question, really. My answer, unexpected, I hope, will be no. I do not believe so. I think Savalesco has got it all wrong in the end. But I do acknowledge the power uh, of his essential point that uh, the narrowest reading of fairness registers for doping, not against it. I come back to my athletic impairment here. As much as I would have liked to have that, had that condition corrected, uh, let me put it this way, my skepticism about the actual in-world use of these agents leads me to feel that in the end they are not advisable at all. That when we look against my entire list, considerations of safety, favoring positional advantage only, the ability to control these agents in their multiple uses, where it will position the locus of achievement, matters of the spirit of sport and spectator enjoyment. Uh, spectator enjoyment actually feeds the power of gene doping here, but it also risks all the other values uh, virtually, except for inclusiveness. And even that, I will suggest tonight, is endangered by gene doping, because those who will use it uh, will actually use it to create a kind of elite uh, of doped excellence uh, that really will not favor or support equality of access at all. So I think savoyescu has got it wrong. It is the nature of sport to emphasize winning, achievement. My cynical outside perspective deepens my apprehension of that to some degree, and my fears of technologies that will only accentuate, not actually reduce those processes. So I end up with a big question mark about gene doping, but I do believe we have a complex series of decisions to make 
in thinking about it. And I'm going to continue some of that this evening. So, thank you.